Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their yarn, knitting and comedy in equally large measures. I'm your host, Joe Milmine, and coming up in today's show, we have Enablers Corner and the return of the sock surgery with the big cast on. I feel a need to laugh again with you, if that's all right. Hello once again my friends, welcome into another episode of the Shiny Bees podcast. This is episode 31 and today is Sunday the 18th of January 2015. How are you all? Have you all had a good time since the last time I spoke to you last week? I certainly hope so, we've been having lots of lovely pretty snowy weather here which I've been enjoying a great deal. The snow never really sits for long, which is probably a good thing because we have a Ponzi car with low profile tyres and it isn't especially good in the snow and getting your snow socks out to get out of the street is a little bit embarrassing. Snow socks are things you put on the tyres of cars to help them get grip and um, yeah, when we bought the car we lived in a place where it didn't really snow much and now we've moved up here we could probably do with some some snow tyres at least but... um, it's very pretty, there's been lots of kind of blizzardy weather and it goes from being really sunny to being a full on white out within about 30 seconds so it's quite quite good fun, I quite enjoy being snug up in the house in my little office looking out the window thinking I'm glad I'm not out there there's also been opportunity for some nice dog walks at lunch times because it's been quite crisp and cold but very sunny as well so I've been layering up the hand knits, getting the baby alpaca on and going off to the woods at lunchtime, which is always good for getting a bit of energy back, really. So I've been sort of overwhelmed with feedback (laughs) since the last episode. So thank you uh, very much for everyone who's taken the time and effort to write to me or to leave comments in the Ravelry thread um, about my little rant in the last episode. Um, I wasn't sure about leaving it in, and when I finished recording it, I thought, that's a bit ranty, I'll probably cut it out. And when I listened back, I thought, actually, no, you've got a bit of a point there, Joe. Yeah, you was totally off on one. Um, but I think it's all things that kind of need to be said and things that really annoy people. And that has proved to be entirely the case. Although I'm not, not quite sure anyone feels quite such contempt towards R&B as, uh, <laughs> as I clearly do. Um, but yeah, I've had lots and lots of messages from people. We had quite an interesting conversation about wargaming or those little, um, the little soldiers that you get that you paint and I have I had a well I, he's still my friend he's an um an RAF guy and he he paint, well a few of them paint them what I didn't realize was um they spent hours and hours painting these little teeny tiny men and little teeny tiny tanks and getting them all exactly right and the detail right on them and like my um not microscope but it's like that magnifying glass magnifying glasses so they could paint them all perfectly and then they meet up for little wars and then whoever wins the war gets to take all of the figures that just blew my socks completely off i was like what you 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 give away all your figures you spent hours making them and he's like giggling away to himself going well yeah yeah it's all part of the fun really um genghis just in case you're listening to this podcast i'm talking about you yes his nickname is genghis (laughs) um and he's a he's a great bloke and uh, it turns out quite a few people like doing um, the wargaming thing as well. So there was a bit of chat about that and a lot of chat about how rubbish loose women is and general stereotyping, what people think of our knitting, what comments are made about our knitting. It's quite interesting. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode yet or you um, are coming to us new this time and are wondering what on earth I'm talking about, get yourself over to episode 30. Um, where I get a little bit ranty and talk about stereotypes in knitting and general woman bashing, get a little bit feminist. Um, and if you've if you've got some thoughts, you don't have a chance to uh, put those down yet. Go on over there. You know, there's there's always time for more chatter. I think so. Thank you very much to you all for getting in touch. I don't think this episode is going to be quite as emotionally charged as the last one. Um. Which is funny, really, because sometimes you 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 record an episode and you think, oh, there'll be loads of chat about this. It's dead interesting. Nobody says anything, and then you record a random one where you go off on one, and um, and everyone loves it. So yeah, it's crazy, but it's good. I really enjoy it. I love it, um, hearing from you all. Um, a bit of a parish notice on the hearing from people thing. 
my info at shinybees.com email address appears to have stopped working. I'm not entirely sure exactly when in the last sort of six months this may have happened. <laughs> I only realised when I tried to send myself an email and it didn't come through and I was like, mm, what's going on there? And it, it stopped working. So if at any point you've sent an email to info at shinybees.com and I haven't replied, it's not because I'm a rude carrier or doesn't have the time to speak to people but talks about how I love speaking to people. It's because your email didn't arrive. So if that is the case and you're still indeed listening because you, you, you've you forgiven me for being a, a rude carrier who doesn't reply to emails, then um, I do apologise. Can you please um, use shinybeesinfo at gmail.com? So it's shiny bees as in the podcast, just shiny bees info, all one word at gmail.com. That definitely works. Mm-hmm. And that is indeed the one I've got on the contact page anyway of the um of the website. So um it's just in case anyone has sent anything and wondered why I didn't reply. I'm not that rude. I would reply to you. So yeah, that's just for future notice. I won't be trying to resurrect the info at shiny bees um email because I've I've no idea when it's gonna fall over again if I do manage to resurrect it. So I'm just going to crack on with other things that are more interesting than than techie goff, really. So that was another parish notice for you. And finally, in other news, before we nip on to Enablers Corner, um, I had a message in the Ravelry group regarding planning for Edinburgh Yarn Festival knitwear. We talked about it briefly and in the last episode and about planning what we're going to wear and are we going to do any special knits and there is a thread in the Edinburgh Yarn Festival Ravelry group where people are already doing just this and talking about just that and have been planning their projects for quite some time there's some beautiful projects in there some great ideas some chatter so if you do want to do a special Edinburgh Yarn Festival project and you want to chat to other people who are doing the same thing then pop on over to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival um, group I will leave a link in the show notes for you to find that and um, I'll put a link also in the Ravelry chat thread for this episode so you can just hop straight over there and have a look what everyone's doing so again without further ado we'll pop on to the enablers corner Now, as I am developing somewhat of a reputation for being a dirty little enabler and following feedback from uh, you lovely listeners after the last episode, we are now going to have an official Enablers Corner segment on the podcast uh, where I enable you to all sorts of different things. Um, It's not just going to be an advertising corner by any stretch of the imagination. I'm really looking for ways to kind of inspire and get you achieving the kind of things you want to achieve really and there will be a few kind of random patterns thrown in there I will probably blag you to try and join a million knit longs and do other crazy stuff with me because that's just how I roll and if you didn't like it you wouldn't still be here so (laughs) I'm going to take that as being a, a good thing you'll be pleased to know or some of you will be pleased to know at least that there will not be a soapbox corner despite several calls for such a segment Um, I'm not quite sure I could be angry enough of the time to well I probably could actually but a lot of the things that I should be ranting about um, are probably not not that craft or knitting related so there won't be a soapbox corner at least not for the time being anyway so last week we were talking about free your skeins and the stash um, heap challenge group and I mentioned that I had been in there and sort of got over my initial shyness and asked for assistance with a perennial problem of mine which is poly whipper me and poly poly whippermus is that even a word should be and um, I have a bit not not as bad as a lot of people it would seem but I have a lot of whips on the go and I would like to figure out how to stop doing that because I think if you have a lot of whips you have a lot of variety but you also possibly spread yourself a little bit too thinly and I've seen the benefit of just concentrating on one project and actually getting things off the needles and I have been quite a good girl this week I've got one one thing finished which was a little jumper for Sammy and then I almost got another thing finished but I ran out of of yarn so I'm just waiting for the last bit of yarn to finish that but I'll talk about that next time in the Whipping Piccadilly section but it when we were talking about it 
we I realised it wasn't that I had more than one whip that there was a problem. The problem was is that I had too many. And then as we got further into the subject and chatted around it a little bit more and people brought out loads of really good points, I realised that the problem is not how many whips I've got, the problem is being an 80 percenter, which was a flash of inspiration that came to me when I was doing Sammy's little funk busting tank top. And it must have taken me about four days to do a job that I estimated would take 10 minutes. And all it was, was to um, do the neck band and do seven rows of rib on each of the shoulders and then sew it up. And I like sewing up. Um, So sewing up isn't the problem. But what had caused it to be static for so long was I tried to pick up the stitches for around the neck and no matter how many times I tried to do it, I could not get the stitch count anywhere near. And it was a lot of stitches out. It was about 10 or 12 stitches short. So it was never, ever going to fit in. And I measured the piece of knitting and it was the size that it was supposed to be. But I couldn't get these stitches right. So even though I picked them up, they got thrilled there. Not interested, can't be bothered. Off you go. And... It occurred to me the other day that it was going to be too big for this thing and actually the front and back of it had took me no time at all to knit. It had been really quick and just rattled straight through it and that I really ought to, because it's quite cold, um, get this thing off the needle. So I picked it up again and I thought, right, now I'm going to sort it. And I picked up the stitches that I had and I was like, right, fine, I'm just going to bodge it. As long as the middle front looks okay and it goes over his head, it doesn't really matter. Rather that than it be thrown to one side and not used and he grows out of it so I just started doing it and I managed to blag it and I looked at it and I managed to figure out because I did it in the round rather than backwards and forwards I figured out how to do to make the kind of the v meet and join together and I did a, a knit two together and pass one over slip one knit two tog pass it back over to make it into the little v as it goes up looks fine looks brilliant did that did the little arms sewed it all up and it dawned on me that that is my problem. I get 80% of the way through a project and I get or I get to a point in a project where I have to think about it and I throw it down and I pick something else up because casting on you don't need to think about it. Um, and this is my problem is that I'm an 80 percenter and when it comes to knitting at least I'm an 80 percenter and when it, when, if it comes to doing something awkward because my knitting time is so short or I'm usually trying to do it at the same time as doing something else, if it requires a lot of concentration, it tends to get left at that point because it needs to be when I'm massively tired and I can sit down and look at it and take my time over it. So this is the problem. It's not too many whips, honest gov. It is being an 80 percenter. So I asked the group for some pointers and some ideas. And as I mentioned last time, they were massively forthcoming with really, really good, solid strategies and tips and techniques um, that could be really helpful. And they already are clearly helping me out because I've finished one project. I'd have finished the other if I'd had the yarn. Um, And two in a week's pretty good going for me, so I'm quite happy with that. And I shall read out a few of their ideas for you now. And we were talking about um, how to manage your whips, basically, and how to keep yourself on track. So the first one was from Flutterby. And she said uh, she recommends not starting another project when you get to the 80% point, but instead using that time that you have to do the other 20% of the project you should use that time instead to choose a yarn and a project and do your swatching. And then you finish the other 20% of the project whilst your swatch is blocking and you get the enjoyment and excitement of something new without casting on and leaving the other thing unfinished. That, I thought, was a really good tip. I thought that was something that can definitely work for me because sometimes I just want to get a new ball of yarn out and put it on the needles. Um. Princess Enyolras, I think is how you spell uh, pronounce it. Brilliant. Love this one. I just cast on a bunch of things and finish them as I need the needles. This is why I quit buying interchangeables. <laughs> Amen to that, sister. Um, I actually read on a blog when I was looking um, 
for some resources and some ideas on this uh, I read on a blog that if you have got a project that has stalled instead of committing to finishing that project and torturing yourself with the thought of a massive kind of slog to get it done if you just commit to working on it for 10 minutes every day instead of committing to the whole thing after a while uh, you make enough progress on it with your little 10 minute burst that it actually spurs you on to finish it it's sort of it's kind of quite a common goal setting thing to chunk things down into manageable amounts and not make yourself do too much like if you start running to run just run to the next lamppost give yourself a smaller more achievable more tangible goal um to do on a daily basis if you can and then after a while you get to the point where it's kind of reaches critical mass and you sort of snowball down the hill um nitty 2013 said Every bit helps. Today I managed 10 rounds on the instep of a sock just by doing it on break and lunchtime at work. Now I'm ready to decrease with a toe. And she said she thinks it can be psychological at times and because now, tonight when she goes home, it won't seem so daunting to start. So that's another really good point. I mean, how many times have you just sat there and thought, oh, I just cannot be bothered getting into this. I'd just do something else instead. Um... Ninja Nitta is indeed Ninja and came out with uh, a really kind of solid step-by-step thing to decide because I said how do you decide which of the um, the whips need to be frogged because we got onto the, the F word um, and she said it's the hardest thing to decide in the world it sort of depends whether or not you view frogging as the death of a project or a potential reincarnation of the yarn and I guess it is because it's like you're losing all of that time aren't you all of that stuff you've already done sometimes you just don't want to let go of the hours you've already put in and she put I ask myself a series of questions and act accordingly to the answers so number one what would happen to it if I finished it with sub questions of does it still fit the original purpose will it fit anyone if I'm not happy with its potential destination frog it this is valid because some people have got whips from like 10 years ago and it's in a size that they're not even anywhere close to anymore. So what's the point in finishing it? You may as well frog it and cast something on in a size that will fit. More on Make It Fit 2015 later. And then she goes on to number two. Why was I knitting this? And is that a still a good reason? If there is no good reason or you can't actually remember, frog it. Number three. Can I bear to frog this? This is the emotional one. Is there too much knitting time tied up in it? Does it have sentimental value? Does frogging it feel like killing it? Or is frogging it demitting defeat? If you can't bear to frog it, it needs a longer time out or you need to slow the chip away at finishing it. I like the 10 minutes a day approach too. Number four. Is it actually possible to frog it anyway? Life lesson learned. You can't frog feathers or fun fur. <laughs> then trash it. Number five. Do you still love the yarn? Does it deserve to be knit into something new? Then frog it. The problem that happens here is that sometimes the yarn has bad knitting and life memories attached. Then frog it and sell, gift or dispose of it to charity. Someone else will love to knit or crochet with it. If your project gets through all these questions, it deserves to be finished. It just needs to realise that it may take time for you to give it your undivided attention. Can you see why I love that group so much now? Um, Just brilliant, although way too many froggets in in, in the recommended actions for me. I'm like, you either frog it or you throw it out, (laughs) pretty much. (laughs) Um, But I thought that was a really good way of looking at it, very systematic and sometimes you know you are just going to think well am I going to finish it maybe I'm not but I'm I'm not I'm not ready to frog yeah I'm not ready to get rid of this project yet and I've done a little stash audit a little whip audit myself this week and I have frogged one thing which was a song of the sea coal by uh, Louise Zaspangham that I was starting to knit in fiber spits scrumptious worsted no DK it was DK worsted and um I'd only got to the cast on bit. I hadn't, I didn't, I hadn't even got her in the second round. It's been sat in there for months. I obviously did not want to knit that pattern. So that one was gone. And I frogged it. And it was a bit tricky to frog because it's a singles yarn. It got a little bit kind of squished. And then I somehow managed to get it wrapped around um, 
the ball winder in a really crazy way. Um, so that was all a little bit stressful. But I frogged it now. The yarn is still pretty. It'll be something else, but it's not going to be that. Whereas there were another couple of sock projects that I'm pretty sure I'm not going to finish, but I'm not really ready to rip it out yet. So I'm just going to leave them. I'm just going to rest them because I've ripped one out and two I'm uh, kind of undecided. And if you're undecided, then you need to wait a little bit longer. That's what Ninja Knitter said. So thank you very much to Ninja Knitter for that. And then following straight on from that, Laura Sue said um, she does spreadsheets. So last year, I think it was last year, she said that's how I whittled... 30 whips down to five in less than a year now i really like the way she did this because she made a spreadsheet of all of the whips that she had and then she applied several different sort of criteria if you will uh, to each whip and given it a ranking on a scale of one to ten with such things as do i love this will i wear it how much do i like knitting it who is it for and the questions are all totally individual. So you answer them per project and then she got Excel to rank them all in order. And that gave her an incentive to keep going uh, when she was kind of near the end, but not quite near enough for that last energy burst. Um, which I thought was really good because it, it it separates I, all of, of the things into really sort of objective uh, categories because I mean there can be a bit of confirmation bias in there if you if you give yourself an idea that something's going to be difficult or something's going to take a long time or you know, it's it's for someone who you don't really want to knit for anymore or anything like that then it biases your choices whereas if you do it like this and do it on really individual criteria um, you might be surprised the way that the order comes out so there was that one and then Little Poked Goblin came in with uh, one of the things I do to finish projects is to take the oldest one with me when we go away and that's all I have to work on so usually I get quite a bit done that's quite good isn't it sort of like holding the gun to your own head in a way but um, I really like that and then the fastest knitter in the west aka Louise Tilbrook said that she was thinking of tracking how much time she spends on projects this year in a spreadsheet to make sure that she's sharing the love around enough she's so fast she's the fastest knitter ever honestly she does 15 things in the time i'm doing one don't know how she does it um well i do really really bloody quickly <laughs> but um it's an interesting concept so i suggested to her that she maybe try toggle which is a time tracking application that you can use for uh, projects I use it for work for tra tracking time for work but you could equally just label it for different projects and it's, it comes with a little app so you can do it on your phone as well and track how long you spend doing it because then you can export it into excel automatically a little productivity hack for you there so lots of brilliant ideas there and very very thankful to the members of the stash heap challenge group this is why I was uh, championing the group so much in the last episode because there's a lot of people there. There's no judgment. There's no judgment about the number of whips you've got or how old they are. That everyone's just like, there's this idea, there's that idea. Lots of really good kind of helpful tips that you can take forward. And I thought that was really interesting. Even if you don't have a stash heap problem, um, quite some quite interesting tips and ideas there because we've all come across a pile of whips and we don't really know what to do with them. So uh, hopefully you will have found that interesting. So again, thank you very much to the uh, Stash Heap Challenge Massive for the top tips there. And on to the next and final bit of Enablers Corner before we go on to the big cast on of the sock surgery. Um, if you listen to episode 20 of the Knit British podcast, happy podiversary to uh, Louise, who's been podcasting for a whole year now on the subject of wool that has grown, uh, spun and died in in the UK and she also texts that as far as saying if you can't get British wool then use wool that's local to you and uh, she ha agreed hugely with the the lush knitting making stuff fit thing and so did a lot of other people so we have now we've got a hashtag which means it's alive and we're definitely going to um, be doing something to do with making things fit making your knitting fit and making clothes that you love and you want to wear that make you feel good because you're a knitter and because you can make it fit exactly how you want it to it just takes a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of effort and knowing what you're doing and 
That was a whole problem with my Lush cardigan. I did not take the time and effort required to do it properly. I do know how to do it properly. If I don't know how to do something, I can go and look it up. But I didn't. I just wanted it finished. Um, and a lot of us do that. Or a lot of us don't really know how to adjust properly for the peculiarities of our own body shape. Um, so we are going to be doing something on that. And it will be after Edinburgh Yarn Festival because we're both very busy in the lead up to that. Um, but if you do have any... Uh, fitting questions when it comes to making garments for yourself or you find that you have a recurring problem uh, or you found a way around it which is what Whiteheart has just popped up on the group and posted that she's found a way of adjusting her knitwear to accommodate she's got an ample cleavage shall we say an ample bust and she's had to come up with a way of putting short rows in to accommodate the extent of her bust because actually if she went off her bust measurement everything else was way too big um there's ways and means of doing it there's loads of resources out there other people have done it likes of Isolde and um oh amy herzog and i'm sure ez will have something to say about it as well but we're just going to get together and try and answer some of the common problems probably and um, get a lot of ideas together about how people go about dealing with common issues uh, when they're sizing up and fitting their knitwear and just encourage we're not going to do a kind of formal knit along or anything like that as such we don't think at this stage but it would be nice if everyone who's taking part could have one well-fitting garment by the end of the year i think that would be a real result on whatever sort of time scale uh, you wish to do it really so watch this space for more information about that but it is going to happen and like i said if you have any questions to do with that um subject then definitely get in touch with us because we we totally want to shape what we're talking about around people's common um problems because there does seem to be quite a theme so you know we like to help people out on the podcast so um that'll be make it fit 2015 so on to the sock surgery or a bit of preamble to the sock surgery i kind of feel like the sock surgery needs its own little intro music but the only thing i can get into my head for that is the salt and pepper let's talk about sex let's talk about sex baby um but changing it for socks not particularly imaginative you've all got an e-worm now for that haven't you tomorrow um definitely not r&b neither <laughs> not that the, it's the start of the rubbish lyrics i think um but anyway, uh, the sock surgery, uh, we're back again with another um, little segment with Claire and Kate and it will be this week about casting on because tomorrow will be the big cast on for the sock surgery for 2015. It is going to run for the whole year and it's going to be a series of fortnightly podcasts with uh, Claire and Kate doing a segment on there with us. There's going to be 12 different constructions we're going to look at, one per month. And we've started halfway through January because what we didn't want to do is start at the beginning of January. And then as you get towards the end of the year and people start doing their gift knitting and it gets really busy around Christmas for it all to kind of fizzle out right as we get into the kind of triumphant end of our, our year of socks really. And to take it over into January to give you that kind of selfish knitting kick and the, the headspace really to just finish off your, your last pair or anything else you want to do. It's really flexible. You can drop in and out as you like. We will do certain um, constructions on certain months, just because then it gives us a focus for the um, for the blog post that that's going to accompany it, and for the segments, it just keeps it all quite tight in terms of keeping it manageable. The amount of information manageable. Um, there's going to be a separate chat thread for every month. Um, and that is just to keep the chat about a certain type of sock in the same place because if you discover the podcast in six months time and you're listening to me in the middle of summer uh, and you want to join in you will be able to go back to January and still find all of the stuff instead of going and reading through 2,000 posts um, that started in January and has carried on um, each month will be a separate sort of thread to try and keep it so that you can dip in and out as you see fit and to keep it as a resource for later on really um there will be a set of pages in the Ravelry group as well so if anyone suggests any good um tutorials or resources we will put them all there so it'll be easy to find at a later stage and we are just gonna 
crack on really. Kate is going to be knitting Tarsi, which is one of Claire's designs. I am going to be knitting uh, Octarine Socks by Rachel Coopy. These are a pair of Coftone heel flap socks and they were designed specifically to go with the yarn from the When Granny Weatherwax Knits Socks. Sock Club. It is a 2012 vintage yarn from The Knitting Goddess and keeping in the free your skins um, kind of mentality, I have three yarns from that collection. I only, I only went with the ones that I really, really loved because I did live in Africa at the time as well so I couldn't get back that often to pick them all up. And um, the Octrine was one of them and I also have Whittle Poons, which is like white and grey and Medicine from Fawn Parts. Um, so I thought I'll go with the Octrine ones because that was the January one for 2012. So it's three years old now the yarn and it needs to be released and it seems fitting that it's in the same month that the yarn club was. So um, I'm going to be knitting that and uh, you can pick any top down heel flap um, sock pattern you want. It doesn't have to be one of Claire's. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't even really have to be that construction. It just will probably help if you want to pick up on tips and things if it is that's the only reason it's not set in stone it's not the law because we're not that bothered it's all just about trying it really and um trying to keep the momentum going because i only have like three pairs of hand knit socks uh, i've got about 15 whips mind but uh and it and my feet get really 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 cold as well uh, like they get halfway up my leg cold um my feet are always cold, even with socks on. So I really want the the only way they ever get warm properly is if I have the um, hand knits on proper wool. Then they get warm. So I want some more pairs. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna be knitting. I'll be casting that on on the morrow. Um. So yeah, if you want to come and join in, come over to the Ravelry group. There'll be a chat thread there. Each month there will be a giveaway as well, and there'll be a prize of whichever yarn that. Kate's knitting her socks in that month. She's going to have 12 pairs by the end of it. Um, we're also going to give another skein of that away. So the prize for January is some of the Bartat Hullabaloo yarn from the Golden Skin. So I think we will pop along to see what Claire and Kate have got to talk about casting on. But um, I did do a blog post last week that gives more of the details. In February we're going to be doing a toe up vanilla sock and in March we're going to do afterthought heel so that's all about the self stripe which is going to be awesome I've got plenty of that in the stash that needs freeing and um, as we go along we'll post more details about what we're going to be covering each month as well we have a hashtag it is hashtag sock surgery so if you are uh, you can join in if you want to double up with any of the other sock initiatives that are going on this year it's dead flexible jumping in and out as you like do whatever you want really as long as you're knitting socks and you're getting somewhere, uh, something that you want to achieve, then then we're happy. You know, we're not, we're very inclusive on the podcast. We like everyone's joining. So um, come on over there and have a crack, really. All, all of the technical blog posts will be on uh, Claire's blog, which is yarnandpointy6.com. She's just in the middle of putting that all into a new website. So it has been delayed slightly, but it is coming. Um, and I'll let you know when that, is definitely all up and running all of the previous um blog posts to accompany the stuff we've been talking about will be on there as well um i think that is all from now i'm sure there's something else i was meant to tell you but the blog post is there anyway and if it gets confusing then just pipe up and ask but um get yourselves all ready because we're going to talk about casting on with claire and kate Anyway, let's not talk about death, let's talk about socks. <laughs> I think that should be the opening gambit. Is that the two it's things in life that are, that are sure to happen? Death and socks. Death and socks. It sounds like a Terry Pratchett novel, or the start thereof. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, I'm, much, I'm feeling much cheerier now. Um, so we're back again today with the sock surgery, and I'm very pleased to welcome my illustrious co-hosts, Claire and Kate, back to the podcast. Hello. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about casting on. Kate, would you like to kick off with your question? Yes, I will. Casting on. I mean, obviously, you about 20 odd years ago when I first learned to knit. My grandma taught me to cast on by just starting with a slip knot and then kind of knitting. But instead of moving the stitch onto the right hand needle, you just 
place it back on the left. So knitting to cast on until you've got as many as you need, which was fine. But then as an adult coming back to knitting, um, it's not necessarily been like the neatest way to cast on for me or um, it can be a little bit tight as well. So I kind of had a look around and learnt to long tail cast on, which I found much better. But I still don't know any more for socks. So I'd now long tail cast on. I do it quite slowly to get a nice even edge and it's a bit stretchier. But I then end up playing a little bit of a cast on chicken at times. So can you give me some ideas of how to make my long tail cast on better or... Is there any a better way of doing it to make a bit of a stretchier cast on if I have a bit of a fat ankle day? A bit of a fat ankle day. Okay. Um, yes. Well, I suppose casting on is one of those things that everybody has the way they were taught um, by their mum or their grandma or whoever taught them how to knit. And, um, and then we start to explore. One of my favourite knitting resources is a book called Cast On Bind Off um, or Cast, it should be Cast On Cast Off but anyway, it's an American book um, and that has 211 ways to begin and end your knitting. So I suppose in summary, there are a myriad of ways to start your socks. Um, as you said, one of the things you're really looking for when you cast on your socks is a good stretch because even if you're not having a fat ankle day, nobody wants to cut off the blood circulation to their foot. But what I also think you need with socks is structure. Um, so you don't want something that's really stretchy and baggy. You sort of want to tread a fine line between stretch and structure. And um, usually what I recommend to people is a, is a long tail cast on is a good place to start. Now, I suppose in terms of getting that stretchy enough, you want to pay attention as you are doing to your tension. You might want to use a larger needle, um, a size or two larger, um, if you're really struggling with a, with a sort of a looser cast on. Some people say you can cast on over two needles, but I never find this works for me. It's um, always a little too baggy and um, you don't want a baggy, a baggy cast in the same way as you don't want one that's really tight. Um, have you, I don't know if you ever tried casting on using a larger needle or, or two I have needles? Tried, I have tried on when I first looked at a tutorial about using a larger needle, um, but then just reverted back to normal, probably because I was being lazy, in all honesty. It is one of those things. I find that if, I, if I'm if i using interchangeables, I don't mind using a larger needle, but if I have to transfer the stitches yeah. from one needle to the other, even though it takes a minute, um, I, I really can't be bothered. So, no, I understand that. And um, actually for socks, my favorite cast on is a German twisted cast on. And it's a slight variation of the long tail. So you do still need to make sure that you have a long enough tail. I usually tend to think that you need about two and a half to three times the length of the cast on. And it's one of those things that sort of practice makes perfect um, in terms of selecting the correct length. But you will sometimes come up short. I often come up short on my cast on and it's very frustrating. <laughs> Um, so the German Twisted Carson is brilliant and there's a, a fantastic video on the internet and I'll link to that and, uh, and Joe will link to that in the show notes as well. And then there's some other castons that you might want to consider that give a really stretchy edge. It really depends what kind of cuff you're using, but if you're using a ribbed cuff, one of my favorite ways for a one by one rib is an alternate cable caston and it's something that uh, Woolly Wormhead uses for her hats. And it creates this beautiful, almost sort of continuous edge, a normal cast on with rib. You'll get the differences between the knit stitches and the purl stitches. I don't know if you've ever yes. seen that. This that, also, that is quite noticeable sometimes. Depends on the yarn, I think. Absolutely. Um, this cable, alternate cable cast on, which is quite similar to what people might think of as a knitted cast on that method where you you actually sort of knit a stitch onto the needle you knit one stitch and then you purl one stitch and it creates this beautiful edge works very well for one by one and Woolly Wormhead has some excellent tutorials for those and she also has variations for two by two rib so it, it works well if you're doing a, a plain cuff if you're doing something a little bit uh, different in terms of your rib count it might not work as well and then there's another cast on that's quite stretchy and maybe not seen as often called a channel island cast on and this is another knotted cast on I'll find some links for people to have a look at for that 
So those are my suggestions for getting a really nice stretchy cuff. The last one is a tubular cast on, which is a little tricky to orchestrate um, and, and to learn. Yazolda has a great tutorial for this, and we'll pop all of those in the, tutor in the show notes. Um, but that, I think, gives quite a similar look to the alternate cable, and I think the alternate cable cast on is easier, but that's my personal preference. So that would be what I think you're aiming for. So just to summarize, stretch but also some structure. So you don't want to use something like a backwards loop cast on, which might give you quite a, a loose sort of edge. And then consider learning some new techniques. I know people often prefer to stick with what they know. And especially if you've not done long tail before, it can feel a little bit like you're all thumbs and, and your hands don't know what they're doing. But once you've learned the technique, it's a little bit like riding a bicycle. You never forget. And it's a really good cast on to use and then you can do the German twisted which is great for a stretchy cast on in my opinion and I think my sort of final say on casting on and I know it's the same with swatching is people don't want to spend a lot of time but I often think if you spend the alternate cable cast on as one of these it takes time but if you compare the amount of time it would take to cast on say half an hour and that, that's quite a generous time I think versus how long it's going to take you to knit a sock, like 10 hours. It, the, the sort of, it, it's, it's a no-brainer really in my book is getting that cast on right. And um, once you've worn a pair of socks that the cuff's too tight on for sort of an hour, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never waste time by doing a, a yeah. bad cast on again because they're really uncomfortable. And it's at the top as well, usually. Yes. So it's the bit that people kind of see first as they're putting it on. Even if you've got a pattern, it's it's still noticeable, the top of the sock. So if it's not neat or if it's not right, then it is going to detract from what could be a, a really nice item. Absolutely. And the other thing to think about is not just ankles, because I know we often think, oh, the cuff and, and sort of the size of your ankles. It's actually, if you think from the heel to the top of the bridge of your foot, that circumference which is significantly larger than pretty much anyone's ankle, um, your cuff has to stretch over that. So if you just look down at your feet while you're listening to this and think about how large that distance is from the back of the heel to the sort of highest point on the, on the bridge of your foot, that cuff has to stretch over that too. So it's not just about your ankle size. Claire, if you were doing um, toe-up socks, mm -hmm. would there be a difference? Well, In terms yes, of obviously there would be a difference, but... What would you do then for casting on? For casting on, we're actually there's so much to do with toe-up socks that when we do the next sock um, in February, we'll do a whole session on toe-up cast-ons. Great. Because there are just so many of them that I think we, we can't... That's cool. Them. It just came to me when I said, well, it's usually at the top, but I suppose if you're going <laughs> toe-up, then it's not at the top, is it? But... No, unless you have very strange feet. And yeah. <laughs> no, we'll do a full episode on toe-up cast-ons because I think there's enough content for that. Okay. So, Claire, we've um, opened up your uh, Dear Deirdre uh, sock agony ant column on the Ravelry group, and I'm very pleased to say that we've had our first question which comes from Lisa GD. Thank you very much uh, for your question. And she says, thanks for the sock knitting feature on the podcast. I've been knitting socks for a few years, but it's still interesting to hear what Claire says. And I've picked up a couple of tips. My question is about adjusting the width of a heel. My heels are narrow compared to the front of my foot. So the heel always ends up feeling too loose. I normally do a heel flap, so if Claire can tell me where to make changes and how to figure out how many stitches to adjust, that would be really helpful. Claire. Okay, uh, thanks for writing in. It's always really interesting to get people's questions because it's nice to know what um, people struggle with and what they want extra information on. I definitely think a heel flap is a, is a good option and there's loads of scope to adjust this. What you're actually looking for, for a narrow heel, is a V or a half handkerchief heel turn. So there are a number of different heel turns. I've covered them in my book, and we will be talking about this in more detail later on, and there'll be some more blog posts. But in the, mean, in the meantime, what you're actually looking for is a half handkerchief heel, and it allows you to turn, as you're doing those short rows on your heel flap, um, what you actually do is you work a much 
narrower center point, uh, whereas many socks will have a, a more rounded or a wider heel. So you'll work a wider central panel. If you've knit a heel flap, this will sound familiar. If you haven't, it might be confusing, but don't worry, we'll go through it later. So definitely a, a V shape or a half handkerchief. If you find that in a pattern, that's good for you. In terms of numbers, I can't sort of give you numbers off the top of my head. So I, I do wish I was a walking numbers machine. That would be great. Um, there's some good resources. So one, my book, um, Sock Anatomy has has numbers in it, but the adult patterns aren't released yet. So they're coming in probably a month or so. Another person who has lots of sock patterns is very well regarded in the sock um, sort of world and has a great heel for narrow foot, well, for heel shapes, is Cookie A. She loves a, a narrow heel. And um, so a lot of her sock patterns would be great for you. In Sock Innovation, her book, she has a full table with all the heel turn numbers you will ever need for every sock from like teeny tiny to large man size foot. Uh, so if you're looking for an immediate resource, I would recommend that. It's a great book, lots of great patterns, and you can't really go wrong with a cookie sock in my opinion. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. Is there a particular type? Because obviously the there are different sorts of heels that you can do and we are going to talk about them over the course of the year and the podcast but is there any particular different types of heels that would particularly suit someone with a narrow heel because I think a lot of women do have quite narrow heels. I think the heel flap with the the v turn or the half handkerchief turn is, is a good option because there's lots of scope there um, and it also I know a lot of women have slender feet and high arches so the joy of a heel flap is that you can adjust your heel flap to accommodate a high instep or a high arch while keeping the turn itself quite narrow. So that would be a good option. A short row heel is quite easy to adjust for a narrow foot because you can just make your center panel far much narrower. Um, it's also very easy to adjust for a wider foot. The problem with a typical short row is there's no gusset. So if you have a high instep, you're going to struggle with getting a good fit. Uh, so those would be my recommendations. Um, there's another couple of ones sort of for a, a, a toe up. Uh, a flegal heel works quite well, I think, for a, a narrow um, heel because it's got quite a tight turn. What you're looking for is when you turn your heel, um, you want that center panel to be quite narrow. So if that's a short row heel, you want to work that center panel quite narrow. And if it's a, a traditional heel flap style turn, um, you want that centre panel to be quite narrow. Yeah, thanks very much, Lisa, for sending in your question. If anyone else has any questions that they'd like to send in that I can give to Claire off the cuff and she can, with her encyclopaedic knowledge, just answer, because she didn't write notes on any of that. She just answered it. <laughs> um, please feel free. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this episode. Thank you very much for joining us all again for another fun Sunday and for the start of our sock surgery. I hope you've picked up some top tips there and if you do have any questions then do put them in the sock surgery agony ant thread in the podcast group on Ravelry. Um, Claire won't be able to answer every single one on the podcast because we've had quite a few already but what she will do is she will pick out ones that are particularly suitable to just chatting through on audio and then others that might need um, a blog post to amplify the points and to explain it better then they'll be up on her blog so don't be shy if you do have any questions then please pop them through to us. Um, if you are going to join us with the sock surgery, we'll all be casting on tomorrow and I'm looking forward to seeing what you all decide to uh, to make with your socks. But for now, I'll wish you all to have a lovely week. Thank you very much for listening. Happy crafting and speak to you all again soon. Bye. You've been listening to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their yarn, knitting and comedy in equally large measures. If you'd like to get in contact, you can do so via the blog, where you can find full show notes every week at www.shinybees.com. I'm Shiny Bees on Ravelry, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and Pinterest. Or you can contact me at shinybeesinfo at gmail.com.